Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this marks the end of another Active Learning Academy cohort. We have six cohorts in a row now, and I'm exceedingly proud of the work that the ALA has done this past year to support active, engaged learning in online environments during a global pandemic. Thank you to all of our active learning leaders, facilitators, cohort members, and to those of you who engaged with us over the past year simply because you were interested and cared about how to use active learning pedagogy to help your students learn better. Active learning practice has shown again how important it is to student success this past year. And I hope you will all consider continuing to engage with the, with the Academy and sign up to participate in next year's Ac Academy as well. So look for information about how to join the Active Learning Academy cohort for 2021-2022 coming out of the Center for Teaching and Learning in late July, early August. Um, a few procedural notes before I introduce our guest speaker. This session is being recorded. Please make sure that you're muted. We will have several opportunities throughout the presentation and at the end for questions and discussion. Please enter any questions or comments that you may have during the presentation into the chat. We have several moderators who are on this call who will make sure your questions are asked during the planned pauses in the presentation. This recording will be available on the Center for Teaching and Learning YouTube channel, and we will follow up with an email to everyone who registered today with resources that Dr. Smith has shared. And so with that, let me welcome our guest speaker. Gary A. Smith, PhD, has directed educational development and professional development programs at the University of New Mexico, UNM, since 2006. He has been on the UNM faculty in Earth and Planetary Sciences from 1987 to 2015, and Organization and Informational Learning Sciences from 2015 to present. He was the founding director of the UNM Office of Support for Effective Teaching from 2006 to 2013, and the founding director and assistant dean for the Office of Medical Educator Development from 2013 to 2019 in the School of Medicine. In 2019, he oversaw the combination of the School of Medicine programs and educational development and continuing medical education for physicians to form the Office of Continuous Professional Learning, where he is the Associate Dean. Dr. Smith has authored and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and books in the disciplines of geoscience, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and the Scholarship of Professional Learning and Development. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Smith. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jules. And uh, you've got to think about time zone. Yes, it is still morning. Good morning, everyone. A little earlier in my morning than in yours. It's really wonderful to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation to spend some time with you, even though it has to be virtual and nowhere near as fun as it would be if I was with you in person. Um, I want to point out that the, that the title, you know, what does discover really mean? Um, and, and for those of you that thought that this was about me handing them off to you, handing off these methods, you know, discovery is something you do yourself, right? So I'm hoping that today's uh, opportunity is one for you to discover and perhaps think perhaps differently about some of the ideas that you've had about how you strategize active learning and how you make use of the uh, pertinent research in your own practice. As, as Jules indicated, I've had a kind of a, a bizarre history uh, at the University of New Mexico. Um, I occasionally still run into old geology colleagues from my 30 years in geology before I became something else. And and I point out to them that when they're talking to their doctoral students in the geology programs that they lead, that they can point out that among the things you can do with a PhD in geology is become an associate dean in a medical school. Um, that's not typically a career path that folks uh, think of following, but it's been an interesting one uh, in my career and has provided a variety of perspectives to my work. But I do want to point out, because I think sometimes when people say, oh, yeah, I'm from the med school, you know, the med school is so different than 
my place of study and work and teaching. Uh, I always do want to remind people that actually most of my teaching career was spent uh, as a geologist, uh, doing all the things that uh, STEM faculty are expected to do as they rise through the ranks of full professor in terms of writing grants and supporting graduate students and postdocs, et cetera, as well as teaching. Uh, before I became involved in running faculty development programs, first on our uh, main campus uh, and now at our health sciences campus. And, and along the way, I found that my curiosity shifted from rocks into thinking about more about how does learning really work and how does that relate to teaching and how do we engage the change processes that teachers would in many cases need to go through in order to adopt research-based practices. And so along the way, I shifted my uh, faculty home into organization information and learning sciences, which abbreviates as OILS and almost gives you the impression I still do geology, although I really don't do very much of that anymore. So my wife is a, is a geology faculty member and I get my geology fix through doing things with her. Um, as I became more engaged in thinking about professional learning and development, I now find myself in the, in the position with a PhD in geology of coordinating and running all the programs for uh, our providers, our health, uh, health providers, particularly our physicians and their continuing medical education. So that may seem kind of scary, like the last thing you'd want to do if you're in New Mexico on vacation is, is go to the University of New Mexico's hospital because you know a geologist is in charge of the professional learning program. Okay, open up chat. If you recognize who this person is, type in the name. Okay, so there, for those of you that engaged in thinking and pulling into your memory and trying to pull something out of memory to put there, that was active. For those of you who were waiting to see what somebody else put in and just wanted to look good by writing what they put in, you were probably being pretty passive. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm appreciative of Adam thinking that's me. Um, interesting thought. Um, but no, yeah, it is Sting. And the, and the question I'd like to throw out there to you is, is how many of you potentially knew that Sting's career before he was a pop singer, he was a teacher. And this is what he wrote in reflecting on his first year as a teacher. This reciprocal relationship between teaching and learning, I think sometimes gets lost. Uh, we have an identity as teacher. We have a very strong commitment to that work. We work really, really, really hard at it. You know, you think about how long it took you to put together that lecture to create those activities and, and come up with the things that represent teaching. But is it in the service of learning? Is it accomplishing learning? Because that's what the enterprise is about. Uh, we often re refer to universities as institutions of higher learning. I yet have seen one referred to as an institution of higher teaching. So keeping in mind that learning is what we're after, take a moment and read these two quotes. So both of them say more or less the same thing, but one of the reasons why I put up that first one is for those of you really interested in thinking about the history and the philosophy and the research of instructional design and the creation of curriculum, the person who so often I think overlooked is Ralph Tyler. He is the creator of backwards design in the 1940s. He was the one that says you start with learning outcomes or objectives and that those must align to the learning activities and assessments. Uh, we associate those ideas with more recent authors whose texts are in front of us. But the ideas have been with us for a very long time. But Tom Schull's elaboration also includes some words that I think are really key to what I wanna talk about today. And I've underlined them there. 
The idea is what are those learning activities? Do we know what they are? Do we really know what they are? And do we know how we get the students to do them? As innocent as that sentence sounds, if we don't have really sound understanding of those two phrases, we're still struggling, I think, to be teachers. And I know it's been a struggle for me. So what I'm gonna do with you today is, um, is in a more of a presentation manner, convey some of the ideas that we often uh, spend about a half day on a workshop with faculty on. So you won't have the opportunity that our workshop participants have to engage deeply in these ideas and think along the way about how to transfer them to your practice. But I hope it'll seed some ideas. Uh, and you're welcome to email me and set up separate conversations in the future where we can chat about how you might transfer these ideas into your work. And I should point out that uh, primarily, I see my work as, a, as an educational developer is, yeah, I do some research in the scholarship of teaching and learning and on change processes with faculty, but mostly I try to find ways to take what I think are profoundly important information in the research literature about the learning activities and how to engage students with them and combine them in ways that hopefully faculty can see they can relate to their, their research. So what I am presenting to you today and talking about is not really my work in terms of the research behind it. The way in which I've combined them, I think a lot of people find kind of unique and helpful, uh, but the ideas are out there and hence you may very well have already encountered them and included them in your work. But I'd like to start by mentioning this article, which many of you likely know, particularly if you're in the in the academy and are a STEM faculty member, this research that was published in 2014 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences was a meta-analysis of a few hundred articles that made direct comparison of student outcomes uh, in active learning versus lecture-dominated classroom experiences. And the, the study has been heavily, heavily cited and used ever since, I think partly because of the robustness of the analysis that was undertaken and the credibility that was given to the publication venue by the National Academies. Um, the authors use an interesting metaphor to summarize their results. And it's one that works really well for me in working with medical school faculty. I'll let you read it. Now, of course, some of my medical school colleagues are quick to point out that it is extraordinarily rare for educational research to match the rigor of a randomized control trial in medicine. Nonetheless, what the authors were trying to convey here was the overwhelming sense of the research that existed and a call for action to uh, change how university level instruction, particularly in STEM, should be conducted. And in fact, uh, in a review of this article that appeared in Science in the same week, Nobel laureate Carl Wyman, a proponent of physics education and STEM education research for reform, wrote this. So, you know, that, that's when you can take to your deans over in the sciences and engineering area and tell them to get on board, right? You're providing inferior education if you don't do something about it. But I ask the questions that are really that straightforward. As much as I'm an advocate for active learning, as much as I workshop this, as much as I mentor faculty, as much as I spend time developing my own skills in it, this is one of the graphs from the Freeman et al. paper. Uh, as a meta-analysis, it looked at different kinds of data sets based on what was in the literature being reviewed. And in some of the papers that were studied, the comparison of active learning and lecture-dominated instruction was compared on the basis of the pass rate or failure rate of the students that were experiencing the two different modalities. And so in this graph, which I think is based on about 65 or 70 of the studies that were looked at in the paper, it's a little complicated to look at along the left axis, I mean the bottom axis rather, is the percentage point decrease in the failure rate in the class with active learning versus lecture. So as the numbers uh, increase to the right and incorporate the blue bars, we're looking at studies where uh, active learning produced anywhere from a zero to a 50 percentage point, not a percentage, but a percentage point, decrease in failure or increase in pass, if you'd like, with active learning. 
And the uh, red dotted line shows the average of the whole data set, about 12 and a half percent for each point. The question I ask is why so much variability? I mean, if active learning is this panacea, it's going to do everything. And why does it go from negative 15 to 50? I mean, why is it all over the place? And, and just what's happening over here? Meaning these, although a very small number of the total studies, represent circumstances where the lecture course actually outperform the active learning uh, modality uh, in terms of the pass rate. And, and this is the sort of thing I like to explore with faculty. Um, because just saying, oh, if I move from lecture to active learning, I'm suddenly going to see these kinds of learning gains that are championed by Freeman and others. And it's like, well, not necessarily. In fact, it may get worse. And so we really need to understand why, rather than just say, as Wyman would have us say, that uh, continuing to lecture is an inferior learning experience. And I think part of the problem is we tend to approach a lot of the work we do in faculty development and teachers who want sort of the shortcut to changing their teaching, they want a recipe. You know, it's like, just, just give me the recipe. Uh, I get this all the time in, with the med, with medical school faculty because they're used to procedures. You know, just give me a bullet list. I, I, everybody in the med school wants a bullet list. It just drives me nuts. It's like, you don't learn anything from bullet lists. And, you know, think about it. A recipe says here the ingredients, and here's how you put them together, and voila. But how many of us have had the experience, or am I just a bad cook? It says, wow, that picture looks really, really great. And, and you know, I, I want to make that, and I'm going to follow the recipe, and it's inedible. Okay. So there has to be a little bit more to it. And yet, so much of what we do looks like cookbooks. There are several volumes of books that look like this in teaching. And, you know, it's very much the same thing. It's like, you know, here's the ingredients. I have to prepare this. And here's how much sort of the cooking time is up here. And, oh, here is the procedure to follow. So we tend to talk a lot about active learning techniques as just pull something out of this catalog of, of a recipe book of approaches. But does that necessarily mean that you get the same result as the expert chef? Or did the expert chef understand some things about teaching and learning that maybe you've kind of brushed over in this bullet list recipe? So what I really want to try to do today is the, the objectives I have for you is to think about how to recognize and hence as you go forward design for the actual behaviors. Remember it was about what the learners do that will maximize the learning potential. And to think about how your approach to instruction and assessing student achievement does or does not motivate, get the students to do it, remember, as a part of our mission to, to undertake those behaviors. And again, this will be a little more challenging, perhaps, from a standpoint of a relatively short presentation compared to our lengthier workshops. But I'm hoping to plant the seed and be happy to follow up. Our pathway is down the bottom. We pretty much wrapped up what I see as the introduction. And, and the first objective is going to be what we spend most time on, and it's connected to uh, looking at learners' behaviors through a model or, or a theory of, of learning called ICAP. And we'll learn what that acronym stands for and how to apply it. And for the second bullet point, um, we're going to look at learner motivation using self-determination theory and SDT. So uh, throwing some acronyms at you. Uh, medical school faculty love acronyms. Uh, they, they like ICAP, they don't like SDT because they work really, really hard to make mnemonics out of their acronyms and they can't pronounce SDT. They keep wanting me to put a vowel in there somewhere so they can actually remember what it means. So we're gonna do this by looking at an example. Go look at ICAP by an example. So let me set this up. We're going to be looking at some data from a lower division engineering material science course. And the, the topic and the objectives for this particular class session relate to understanding some properties of metals that are really, really critical to engineers, particularly their elastic properties, the extent to which they can be deformed and maintain shape, and the extent to which they conduct heat, their thermal properties. And point out that these elastic and thermal properties are actually directly related to the molecular structures of those metals, so that we can actually predict or more deeply understand, if you'd like, those properties if we understand the molecular structures of the metals. So what I'm gonna show you next 
is a, there are four brief descriptions of learning activities or learning behaviors that were engaged in by one fourth of each of their behaviors by one fourth of the students in the class. Now I'll just give you an opportunity to read through them. And as you read them, I want you to rank them. That your highest rank is your first in your list, your lowest rank is your last in your list. If you were a student, if you're looking at the students in each of these four groups, which do you think would understand the principles more deeply and hence retain it for the future? So take a moment, read through there and rank them. And I'll poll you on your ranking in a moment. Okay, I'm going to stop the polling. And I'm going to share those results. So one of the things that may have caught people's eye, probably did, is to notice that the first thing that stands out about A compared to B, C, and D is it talks about pairs of students. The other uh, options all relate to the activities that the students are doing on their own. The behaviors are observed as things that they were doing on their own. Um, sometimes we, we wonder a little bit in our comparison of C and D, they seem very, very, very similar. The, the one difference is that in D, the students are doing something beyond reading or listening. They're actually making choices when they try to figure out what's important to know and underline. Sometimes uh, people that put B down on the list are concerned that without guidance from the learner, by, from the teacher on what to do, the student will just, just flail. Um, and this is an interesting issue because um, we've known since some really interesting research that was published all the way back, gosh, I think maybe even in the 80s or 70s. Uh, there's an interesting article out there called A Time to Talk. And it points out that learning is actually better when we uh, give students the problem to try to solve on their own before they know how to solve it and then talk about it. <laughs> um, because when we actually generate that knowledge ourselves, construct it ourselves, it is, is much more deeply and firmly um, understood. So I'm going to stop sharing those results and close them and show how this study fits into this concept called ICAP. The ICAP model uh, is a way of looking at what the learner is actually doing. What are the actual behaviors or artifacts of their work that we can see and look at? So it looks at it very much as a learner-centered approach because it doesn't say, what did I intend the learners to do? <laughs> it says, what did they actually do? Or what do I, I'm pretty sure they did based on the overt observable behaviors and artifacts. And the concept has been developed over uh, more than a decade of work by Mickey Chi at Arizona State University. And because of this work, she just last year was the recipient of the National McGraw Prize in Education uh, for Excellence in Education in Higher Ed. And the, this model essentially says, as you might imagine, there's four steps and they start with the letters I, C, A, and P. And we're gonna start at the bottom, P. P stands for passive. It's a focus on receiving information and either not encoding it in memory at all or just encoding it as you hear it, writing verbatim notes, maybe remembering some of the things that are said, maybe not all the others. It's notable when you scrutinize this picture, there are two people that are holding a pencil in their hand, even though everyone's got a notebook out in front of them. Um, Active is a step up. It says you're actually making decisions. You're selecting, you're comparing, contrasting. You may be manipulating things. You may be writing things down. Uh, verbalization of how you understood something. It was just said by repeating it as an example of manipulation as well. That's the A and I cap. Then we go up to the C, constructive. In the constructive mode, the learner is actually still doing things by themselves but they're actually generating something. They're coming up, they're being asked to 
do something, produce something that wasn't directly in the um, in the instruction. For instance, there may have been a series of concepts in the reading or in a series of lectures, and then the student is asked to make a concept map of those. The creation of that concept map and the linkage of all these ideas together represents them creating knowledge, not just reproducing what they've already received. And the interactive is essentially saying we're going to generate in dialogue with at least one other person. So we're still creating new things. We're not just talking about what we've already learned in some other context in the instructional materials. We're, we're creating something. We're not trying to create cold fusion here, but we're, we're doing something that is new to us. We've, we've, we've put together knowledge in a way that we have structured and organized and come to understand separate from what the instructor or the textbook provided. And in Qi's theory, which was originally described in 2009 in terms of appropriate literature that was out there to, uh, there was actually good indications of what the learners really did. It's amazing how little education research is actually based on what the learners do versus what the teacher did <laughs> or how the curriculum was designed or intended to work. So she took the literature that was out there. She took principles of educational psychology and married them together. And when she put together ICAP, she says, you know, the learning should sort out hierarchically. Interactive will be constructive, constructive will be active, and active will be passive. And the study that I just showed you with the uh, material science was a subsequent study, one of many, where people started saying, OK, since many studies weren't really designed to directly test this idea, let's start doing the studies that directly test them. So that was an example from the engineering literature. Each of these four categories of behaviors by the students uh, represents a part of ICAP. Down there is passive. Here is active, the, the act of selecting. There was constructive. The student had to put it together on their own by looking at the data and the relationships between uh, properties. And here they were doing the same thing with, uh, with a peer, and so that made it interactive. So remember then the hypothesis or the theory says that we should see learning gains that stack out uh, in this order. And there are the data from this study, and there's been others done in other fields. When you look at their knowledge of the relationship between molecular properties and the interact in the um, elastic and thermal properties of the metals before this module of learning, everyone was pretty much the same and would have failed the test if they took it that day. Um, but when you look at the learning outcomes afterwards, uh, they do show variable learning gains that stack out in the order that were predicted by ICAP. And I think an important thing to understand here is that most people's very broad definitions of active learning would include all of those. And yet the amount of learning that took place is more than 25% higher in interactive than it is for active as you find in the ICAP model. And what that's really telling us is to think really about what's going on in these different sort of knowledge change processes. The student may be paying attention, but they're just taking in information and not being asked to do anything with it, not being specifically asked to uh, connect it to prior knowledge. At least in the active mode, there's a greater likelihood that existing knowledge is, is coming out. I have to make a choice about what's important or not based on what I already know, for instance, in the example from the material science course. But when we get up to constructive, you're actually inferring things that weren't told to you in the instructional materials. You're, you're actually taking your existing knowledge, new information is put in front of you, and you're producing something beyond what was presented to you in the instructional materials. And in the interactive mode, everybody in the team is doing that themselves and collaboratively. The key word here is generative. A lot of active learning really is only active on this chart. I had the students do some things. I'm going to put them together in groups and see if I remember what I told them or what was in the book. I'm doing active learning. I'm not lecturing to the students right now. The students are talking. But what are they doing? Are they generating new knowledge or are they repeating what was already provided in the instructional materials? In fact, this importance on generative has gotten to be so significant that some workers in the life science education research arena are suggesting to drop the word active learning. It's too broadly defined 
and it doesn't represent what's most important. We should be talking about generative learning. I don't know whether Jules is gonna call this the Generative Learning Academy next year or not, but it's something to think about. Not all active learning strategies are equal. And so they're not going to create the same amount of learning. And that is probably part of what we're seeing in the Freeman study. Another part of it is inability to follow recipes well. That's been well documented in the literature too, that people don't implement research-based active learning as well as it could be. Probably the best way to really kind of come to grips with understanding ICAP a little better is to think about what does it look like in a classroom? So I'm gonna show you in sequence three short little video clips that were taken from a geology class. And what I want you to do again is, is you wanna watch what the learners are doing. What are their behaviors and where you can see they're creating something? What are those artifacts of learning? And think a little bit as you're starting to maybe jostle with these ideas of interactive, constructive, active, passive, what are you seeing? Now, something to keep in mind is that it's gonna change during the class session. And what you're gonna see with one learner isn't necessarily gonna be the behavior you see with others. So you don't just say that one hour lecture, constructive. That one hour class, that was constructive. No, it was all over the place. Um, but the more generative it is, probably the better learning outcomes. And not every student's going to engage in that. We're going to come back to that later. And then we motivate them to get involved in that hard generative work. And so actually what I'm going to encourage you to do is while you're watching the uh, videos is, and, and, and you know, you know, we're all friends here, right? So you have nothing to be embarrassed about. Anytime you think you're seeing a behavior somewhere and you want to put one of those ICAP labels on, just type it in chat. If you see another one, type it in chat. Let's just have this running scroll going in chat of what sorts of learner behaviors and products you think you're seeing. So let me set the stage. The course is being taught in uh, what you folks may call an active learning classroom. It is a scale-up design classroom after uh, the founding work uh, by Bob Buechner and others at UNC, uh, Chapel Hill. Um, it is a geology course that has a mixture of majors and non-majors. So it's uh, both an intro to the major as well as a general education course. And most of the students are there for their gen ed credits. This particular class session relates to, as the title on the screen says, motion inside the earth. Yes, the inside of the earth is moving. Even though most of it is rock, it is actually in viscous convective motion. And man, that is really difficult to grasp, but that motion is what drives a lot of what we see happening at the surface. So it's really fundamental geologic knowledge to have, but it's extraordinarily abstract. It goes against intuition. We can't go down there and see it. So you kind of have to figure out how do we even know that's really happening? As so you can imagine that for a bunch of underclassmen, non-science majors, this is like, whoa, this is gonna be really hard to get along with. I don't believe it. So it can be a very difficult subject to teach. Now you can notice that on the monitors and the back walls, uh, you see a lava lamp. That lava lamp is actually up on the teacher's station and has a, has a desk cam pointed at it uh, because the motion inside a lava lamp is gonna be used as an analogy for the, the learners to deal with and think about in terms of what's happening with motion inside the planet. Uh, let's try to take something that's concrete and known, see if it can transfer it to something that seems abstract and invisible. So uh, three short videos. And again, just, just type the words in the chat when you think you see it. All right, that little in-class exercise was to help you distinguish between thermal convection and chemical convection. Where does thermal convection occur in the Earth? The mantle. Where does chemical convection occur? The inner outer core boundary, primarily in the outer core. Okay? And it is a result of iron crystallization. So let me explain that to you with this diagram, which happens to be figure 10.4. 
So in the diagram on the far left, you're going to notice that this is the inner core and this is the outer core. And the outer core is liquid. Okay? It's molten iron metal. And the inner core is solid iron nickel metal. As the entire planet overall, in general, is cooling, the inner core is growing at the expense of the outer core. That means someday in the future there will be no outer core. It will be one <coughs> giant solid inner core. Okay. So now, how does that happen? We start to form an iron nickel crystal, which means we have to take iron nickel out of the liquid. Does that make sense? We're taking the liquid out to make the crystal. The crystal is more dense, and so it sinks and settles. But that little patch of liquid is now has less iron and nickel in it. So is it more or less dense? It's less dense, and so it starts the convection cycle of the outer core. And we did not need temperature to do that. All we needed to do was crystallize the iron. So it's uh, fun to see your responses coming in there. Um, we got some actives and passes, and we never got above that. Um, what do you call somebody that gets up and walks out of the classroom in the middle? Uh, that's called unengaged. May have been a very, very good and appropriate reason for her to leave the classroom at that time, but clearly learning is not part of the, what's happening for her at that moment based on her behavior. It is interesting. It's, during a lot of what you're seeing here, it, it probably is mostly passive. Um, one thing I do find interesting is even though notebooks are out and tablets are out, um, the, the person over here who you saw on a computer at the beginning was actually finishing the submission of the in-class assignment for his group. So he actually wasn't taking notes. This woman over here uh, had a pencil in her hand a great deal of the time, but what I find interesting is it never moves as would happen if you were writing across the page. So I suspect she was doodling. Um, and that can be a way for some people to help maintain attention. Um, and, and attention is a key part of passive learning. If, if you can be passive, but at least you gotta pay attention. And, and most of these folks, as you see, they are looking at one of the monitors or screens. Um, attention is well paid, except for the person that left the room. Uh, there's one person down here on their phone at the moment, maybe not paying so close attention. Um, but there are times where some people are clearly active. Uh, some people are answering questions. So they're soft, so they're either very shy and they were all talking, or only a few people were really saying, I care about making that choice to answer the question. But the people that are answering that question are being active. They're saying, okay, it's this, based on what you've said, based on what I've read. In those moments, they are active in the ICAP scenario but we're really not getting any farther than that. In the next scene I'm gonna show you, peer instruction with iClicker with an audience response system is going to be shown. Uh, many of you may use peer instruction. For those of you who don't, I'll explain it very, very quickly. Uh, it is, is an intended approach to promoting interactive learning as well as assessing what the learners know at the same time. There's a discrete research-based uh, process scheme to follow. First, you project usually a multiple choice question. It's conceptually rich. Uh, you ask the students to respond individually to that question with a response device without talking about it. The instructor can see the responses. The students are not shown the responses. That's critically important. In this case, the instructor should actually be happy uh, that only that fewer than half the students got A as the correct answer, because that means this is actually a good question for peer instruction. If everyone got it right, it wouldn't be anything to talk about. It means that the choices have actually tapped into some misconceptions and misunderstandings. And so if I can have the students now get together and discuss their competing answer, the interactive phase, then hopefully they'll be able to teach one another uh, what's most important to understand about the concept for this answer. You then pull again and magic happens. Often there's more learning takes place in a couple of minutes of the students talking to one another than the hour long lecture you gave on the topic the day before. And then you debrief that. So we're gonna see clips and pieces of that peer instruction process as a part of this classroom session on motion and cyber. And again, type in chat what you see. Okay, let's 
try this one. So here's an example of where you can see things are changing during the, the class time, at least perhaps in terms of the intention of the instructor. You actually want the students to be individually choosing their answer initially. You don't want them interacting. You want them to pull out what they feel is the best answer. Um, and that choice is, is an active choice. You know, they're having to read that, say, what do I know about that topic? I have to make a decision and I have to answer it. Now, Ellen, I noticed in chat, made a really, really, really critically important point. It could be constructive depending on the question. This is so central. It's all about the questions. If you're just asking students to draw upon information, mostly factual, or a conceptual idea or an example that was already worked through by the faculty member or was presented in the book or a video or other instructional materials, you're never going to be generative. At least not as the overt behavior of most of the students unless they covertly decide to take it a step further. But if that question required the student to take things a step further than anything that had been covered in the instructional materials, it would be constructive. It's all about the question. And so um, I didn't really make that flip back there just a second. Um, sorry about that. Um, what's interesting then is there's the part of the video where you see two of the three person teams. I should have clarified, oh, there's nine people at each table. The teams are teams of three. And so there was one three-person team that were talking with each other quite a bit. And you can see well, there's manipulation, you know, they're, they're not actually showing convective motion. And so you probably think, interaction, interaction. But you notice that other team across the table, the two women and the guy, you know, at one point they seem a little self-conscious. The camera's on them. We're just kind of sitting here. Oh, <laughs> Oh, now we're supposed to answer again. Okay, there's my second answer. Very, very different obvious behaviors going on there. 
And so you might have thought, well, that team across the table, man, they're passive. They're just sitting there. They're not saying anything. They're not doing anything. And there's no over behavior that tells me that they're learning anything here. And then there's this group that's talking, interacting, and they're moving their hands. That must be interactive. Okay. Goes back to Alan. It all depends on the question. And that last view of the screen showing the before and after responses was a little hard to see. But what it really showed is that the initial responses weren't in the sweet spot. This was simple remember level stuff on Bloom's taxonomy, checking to see whether you did the reading in the home before you came to class. And so for that team of three that was doing nothing, this was cake. We all got the right answer. We don't feel a need to talk about anything. Yep, we're just sitting here waiting. We were active when we pushed our button and now we're just sitting here seeing what's gonna happen next. The other team that was more interactive without listening in, I always encourage, you know, walk around and listen to what's going on in the heads of your students during their active learning assignments. Without really listening in, it could be a little challenging, but we've listened to different parts of video from this class. And what it turns out is that two of them had the same answer and the other one didn't. And so the, the two were sort of trying to help the other one understand what was going on. So they're kind of teaching that person and he's asking good questions. Um, but it's the, the question itself was not generating new knowledge. Nobody got above active in this exercise. Because of the question and the behavior it generated, it did not generate generative learning. Let me show you one more. Type in what you think is happening along the way. So what we're going to be, well, as far as the base, what we want to do is we we'll want to have, you know, what we'll be doing is we'll be showing you the convection, right? Is that what she's asking? Yes. Is the convection, the radiation that will probably be up in the air pocket, and then the convection. Yeah. That's the convection. Right. So, just going on down here. Yeah. What do we call that there? So then we could kind of put it just off into the different directions, like arrows, just squiggly arrows, maybe, for radiation. Yeah. And that's all That's all there is, correct? Convection, convection, radiation. I love the option. This whole area here is that the heat's coming up, and then as it cools down, it kind of sinks. So that's a representation of this area. So that's the convection here. And then the radiation is the... So it's interesting. There's a lot of variation in answers to interactive and constructive. And that's fair, because what you may have noticed is that one of the learners may have been learning a great deal from one or the other of her, his colleagues. Um, and for those other two, there may not have been anything new happening here. 
all three of them were not necessarily collaboratively constructing something that was new to all three of them. There's little question that something, an artifact was being created here, um, but it may not have been as fully interactive because it wasn't as fully participatory in terms of all of them generating new knowledge. One of them may have been mostly receiving it and sort of following directions on what to draw. Nonetheless, this was a great active learning in, in quotes, generally speaking, active learning experience because you're actually seeing how the learners are collaborating with one another to understand something, create some new knowledge for some, maybe it's old knowledge being regurgitated by others. There's a lot of great socially shared regulation of learning. They're checking and say, that's all we needed, right? We've accounted for everything. Isn't this what that happens? They're asking each other questions. They're asking each other whether they understand. That's an incredibly great teamwork in a learning environment. But again, if we come back to Ellen's question, if perchance in the educational materials, the students saw a video of convection, conduction, and radiation in a lava lamp, they didn't generate a darn thing unless this was new to them because they didn't do the homework. So it's all about the question. It's all about the activity. So let's pause there with ICAP and think what questions or comments you have before we head into that smaller green pie slice to finish. Not seeing a lot of questions in the chat, um, Gary, but I am seeing good commentary. Yeah, really great comments. Yeah. Sorry if it looks like I'm looking weird here. I got two screens and I'm looking at the other screen to read the wonderful things that are being written. And, and I think you're really hitting on it. We tend to focus on the class as a whole, but the learning is an individual thing. What someone takes away is theirs. It's their brain that now has that memory and was created somehow. And so we don't necessarily expect the same behaviors to be utilized in the same way by every learner. But our intentions can aim towards the constructive and interactive, the more we're asking people to undertake generative behaviors, the more we're asking them to create something that we didn't tell them. Just having them come together and talk is active in ICAP, but notice active isn't all that good in ICAP. <laughs> Gary, you've got a question. Um, can you reiterate the difference between constructive and interactive, please? Thank you very much, Ellen. And it's, and it's just a matter of whether it's a, per, a learner by themselves or whether that generative activity is taking place with at least one other person. And, and in particular, the idea is that um, they have to, um, both of the, let's say there's just two people, in the case there were three, the things we would hear all three people saying must be mostly generative. They're making, they're, they're creating and sharing new ideas uh, that's adding beyond what was already presented in the learning materials. And each person's contribution must acknowledge the contributions the others are making so that they're making sure they're seeing what others are sharing in the learning process. So a lot of it's a matter of, of is this happening alone? or is it happening uh, with one or two or more people? Um, so there's one more question. Can you describe the role of acknowledging? Yeah, and this is something that I, I, I try to help faculty, particularly when they teach in these scale up active learning like classrooms, to spend a little time up front in the course, figuring out how do we learn as a team? How do we learn as a group? How do we function as a group? And this whole idea, you, you know that you're listening and understanding your teammate when you're saying, oh, so what you're saying is, or your idea relates to what we're talking in this way. So those are examples of acknowledging it's making sure that people are being heard. And by repeating that, it's making sure that you understood them the way they intended to express the information. Because a lot of times, you know, people kind of talk in garbled ways, particularly about topics that they don't understand very well right in the moment. And so making sure that you understand what your partner was saying and how to learn from it as part of that acknowledging process. Okay. 
And Adam had an interesting point. I think it was Adam. Yeah. How can you motivate them to want to participate in the interaction part of ICAP? That's the green pie slice. It's coming up. Okay, we ready for more pie? Okay, so now, now we know what behaviors we want the learners to engage in as teachers. How do we want them, how do we get them to want to engage in? Because it doesn't do any good to have these intentions if they don't actually happen. So, you don't need to write this down, but I just want you to think about the very first thing that comes to your mind is something you do because you really enjoy doing it. Very first thing pops into your mind, just hold on to it. If it was me, the first thing I would say is I love photography, I particularly like wildflower photography. That's my passion. And when we do this in larger workshops, we actually ask people to write this down on a three by five card. And then everyone gets up and they trade their cards three times. So it's going to be completely anonymous. And then we categorize the responses. And what they tend to fall into are, are the things that I'll show here. And by asking you, what is it that you do that you do because you really enjoy it? That's what intrinsic motivation means. This term intrinsic motivation is not well understood by non-psychologists. It tends to be defined much more broadly than it really is. If you don't enjoy doing it, the inherent satisfaction from it, it is not intrinsic motivation. And this is something I really want to have you take away because I can't tell you how many teaching philosophy statements I've read where it starts out, I want my students to be intrinsically motivated. It's like dream on, all right? They're not here because they love you in the class and it's just the highlight of their day, okay? And I think one of the reasons we define intrinsic motivation so broadly is we, we think extrinsic is bad and we define it too narrowly. And so I want to try to help engage you with what intrinsic and extrinsic really mean. So when I ask you the first thing, and if I ask you five things, you'd come up with something else. But the first thing is the thing that you're most intrinsically motivated to do because you enjoy it and find it inherently satisfying. Typically, when we do this in workshops and we collect we pile the answers, you know, it's things that we do that are creative, you know, photography, I do painting, I write poetry, I make pottery, I I enjoy building things, I enjoy performances and performing, and I play a musical instrument, even though I don't perform for others. It's something I really you know, I enjoy also the music, outdoor activities, rock climbing, sports, travel. These are the things that come to mind. Less than 5% of the responses refer to teaching. Refer to scholarly activity. Or at the medical school, refer to caring for patients. And yet these things are our, our professional identities, right? And if I had to ask you five or 10 things, you'd have probably hit one of those, but I'm willing to bet that very few of you in this room chose something in those categories, just based on my experience in doing this activity with people. Self-determination theory houses the modern psychological definition of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. It's developed by Richard Ryan and Edward Vesey at the University of Rochester. There's 50 years and about 3,000 publications and research groups around the world that substantiate this approach to understanding what people will engage in, why they engage in it, why they change, how they change, what motivates change, what motivates learning. It explains everything in the world. Once I came to understand self-determination theory, I use it every day. And the essential says an intrinsic motivation arises from full satisfaction, full satisfaction of three basic psychological needs. One of those is competence. I can do this. I'm effective at this. I take ownership of it. I have a pathway for improvement that I follow at my pace and I, I just feel competent at the things that I'm intrinsically motivated to do. I feel connected to other people. I'm responded to and respected for the things I do. I matter in the eyes of others. And this can be even true for activities you do by yourself. I mean, for instance, me as a photographer might say, well, how does that build my relatedness? Well, it's because I have a connection to a whole bunch of other people who do photography. I have, I'm respected by my colleagues who say, wow, I went to your photo website and that is just so neat that you're doing that sort of thing. A surgeon photography buddy of mine, and I apologize for some language here, emailed or texted me last night after visiting and looking at some new creative compositing I, pictures that I put up on my website and he said, Gary, you're badass. 
there's a relatedness there. I think I was supposed to take that as a compliment. Autonomy. And autonomy as a basic psychological needs defined a little bit differently in self-determination theory than we often think about. We often think autonomy is about having choices. We do it because I'm doing it. No one else can do it. Faculty are usually big on autonomy. You know, I'm an autonomous faculty member. I do what I do. I have academic freedom. The administration can't tell me what I need to do, et cetera, and so forth. Well, that is a part of autonomy. But another part in self-determination theory is that even if the activity originated external to me, I say, yeah, man, I could own that. It is so consistent with what matters to me and the goals I have that I feel like I'm exercising my autonomy and undertaking that that task or that activity. So it's about autonomy, competency, and relatedness. So I'm going to do a poll question here. Only one of these statements by a student in a geology class, mine, is truly indicative of intrinsic motivation as we define it here. Which one is it? So we had a close race there, nip and tuck, if it had been the Kentucky Derby between B and D. So we're gonna give away to D was, I really enjoyed this, it was neat. Yeah, that's the statement that is most uh, aligned with intrinsic motivation. Uh, I'm glad to see that none of you chose C because there's no external motivation there. I mean, no internal motivation there. It is entirely externally driven. Structure has got me here. I have to do this for them to get the grade. The others, A and B, those are not attitudes that we would just like seeing among our students, but they're not expressions of inherent joy and satisfaction. They are indeed extrinsic, but not all extrinsic motivation is bad. And that's the thing, it's so cool about self-determination theory is to understand motivation is on a spectrum and we can't simply draw a line, so that's extrinsic, that's extrinsic, this is bad, that is good. And stop sharing those results, and close that down. And now, three of these statements you've already seen. I took the truly intrinsic one off and added one. So now what I want you to do is think about how you would order them. Putting at the first, which one has the greatest sense of internal control, greatest sense of autonomy, and perhaps relatedness and competence too? and then rank them out to the bottom. And so the poll will be a little more complicated because I'm trying to give you a variety of answer possibilities without all of the combinations and permutations. And make sure if your polling box is small per chance that you pull it down or scroll to see all the possibilities. Okay, as the horses round the first corner, yeah, it's a dead heat. The pack is not separated in the first 12 votes. A few furlongs to go. We've got a horse in front and a whole slew right behind that. Oh, we got, we got somebody really catching up here. Oh, I hit a little. Five more seconds. See which horse wins. Okay, we got two thirds of you in there as votes. We're going to go with that. And the polling. Here they are. All right. Look at this will inspire you to read some about self-determination theory. It's really cool if you want to really want to think about what motivates people to do things. The ABC, 
one by a little bit, and that is indeed what self-determination theorists would argue is the best ordering here. Notice it starts with B and A. Uh, the two that got the most votes after the real intrinsic one on our last poll. Uh, that B, I mean, there's just a whole lot of autonomy expressed there. There's just a whole lot. This understanding this, even if it was potentially hard work and not enjoyable, man, this meets my goal. There's a lot of autonomy in there. And so we want to rank that one high, even if there isn't an expression of joy and inherent satisfaction. A is like, okay, you know, I, I'll go on with, I'm learning, I have to admit I'm learning. I, I've heard this a lot from students in my actual writing class. I don't know what you do. It's like, you know, I'm a computer science major. I could care less about this stuff. I have to admit, you know, I'm learning. What you're asking me to do, I feel is okay because I'm learning. You know, it doesn't really fit with any other, other value except getting good grades. Um, yeah, C. You know, that's entirely externally driven, as we mentioned before. It's sort of what most of us think is the definition of extrinsic motivation. And D is just one step up. There's a little bit of internal control in there. There's a little bit of your own ego. <laughs> yeah, I'll do this because I don't want to look bad. And so within self-determination theory, we actually have a full range, a spectrum of extrinsic motivation. We would lay out this way, and this will produce more cognitive load than you care for. Yeah, the theorists provide names for all these in terms of the regulation, the degree of internal and external control, and definitions of those. And again, I would argue that that doesn't happen very often. The intrinsic motivation isn't there very often. But what I try to do is say, even if the student isn't going to take another geology class, I want them to have an identified or integrated regulation. I want them to at least say there's some value here, even if it's not part of my goals. And if I can get them to say, yeah, this was important for me to do uh, because it really does fit with some goals. I don't necessarily need them to jump for joy and feel this was just the highlight of their day. And so it comes back to Adam's question, how do we do that? So there's a, quite a, a fair bit of literature about the sorts of practices and the way we design courses, the things we ask learners to do, the ways in which we assess learners, the way in which we give grades that either support those basic uh, psychological needs of autonomy, competency, and relatedness. Those that relatedness or relationship support could be between the learners, it could be between the learners and the type teacher. Um, yet the antithesis of each of those is, is a controlling uh, learning environment, an over-challenging one where the student doesn't feel like they can develop competence and that relationships are rejected and not expected. And in our longer workshop, we actually spend time having faculty think about what they would put on either side of that dividing line. And we do gallery walks of those lists and we compile them together. And this is often quite an aha moment for faculty when they realize that they actually have to acknowledge that many of the things that they do and expect the students fall on the right side and not the left. And you can't expect people to engage in things that you want them to do, the behaviors they want, if those basic psychological needs are not being served. So supporting learners from where they are versus a strong uh, emphasis on achieving grades, for instance. Feedback that coaches for improving performance, for really making the student feel like you're in this with them, you're developing a relationship that's supported to build their confidence, their competence rather, versus feedback that tends to diminish senses of competency or a supportive relationship with the teacher. Having some choices in the learning pathways versus being forced in a specific direction or only doing it my way. Being involved in learning and figuring it out on your own or with others, rather than just the expectation of passive intake of knowledge from authorities. These are examples of things that fall on either side of whether we're really supporting basic psychological needs or not. And so to wrap things up for a final Q&A, what I'm trying to get across to you is here are two concepts, ICAP and SDT, 
that are never really talked about in the same conversation, but I think they're the key to our successes because it's about what are the learning activities that matter and how do we get the students to do them? ICAP provides a spectrum of approaches for knowledge gaining. SDT provides a spectrum of ways of meeting psychological needs to engage in those activities. Our target is in the upper right quadrant. I don't think we can always pin ourselves in the corner, but try to create opportunities for students to spend a significant amount of time in constructive and interactive, in other words, generative learning, where they're creating things themselves. And that they're doing it at least because it's an identified motivation. Yeah, I'm learning, this is worth engaging with. And perhaps integrated or even intrinsic. And a lot of that, thinking back to Adam's question, is that the questions, the problems, the ideas that we're bringing into the classroom need to be authentic, they need to be relevant, they need to pique the learner's interest. Most students want to be creative in creating solutions and not just feel like I'm being asked to repeat the answer that the instructor wants me to repeat. That often kills interactivity. A lot of my experience in doing classroom observations when a faculty member wanted students to get together and solve a problem as a group, and they said, but they don't. They sit there and do it on their own. And I said, that's because it's more efficient. The question's not tough. It, it's faster and easier just to do it yourself. Why do I have to talk with somebody else? It's, you know, two plus two, four. Let's sit here and talk about, well, it could be 3.99. No. Why do they get 4.011? No. You know, the questions have to actually be challenging enough to create bringing people together to discuss it or else they're not going to discuss it. You want the, even the most well-prepared and confident students to say, I really want to talk about this, but I'm not really sure. And so if you're not creating that, which is a relatedness and it's building competency and the choice of the questions is their autonomy, it all fits in. And so I'm going to shut up and see what additional questions you have or comments to contribute to the idea. Thank you so much for that presentation, um, Gary. I'm going to uh, take a look to the chat now. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, we've got about 15 minutes left in the session for Q&A. And you can just enter those into the chat, and we will ask them of Dr. Smith. Um, Julie has a really good comment here that I'd like to share with everyone. Um, Julie typed in, in one example, it was a connection to disciplinary identity that acted as a drive and motivations. Autonomy for gen ed courses can be precarious. Having to take the course and or even feeling like they have to go to school, not their choice that they feel. It's a university mandate or pressure from others' expectations like their parents. The effective dimension makes this very complex. I, I agree. And, and some students will come in with such a strong preconceived notion that I'm just going to do the bare minimum to get through. Um, that, you know, that's already preset. Um, one thing that I appreciated in my geology teaching and in the example of the course that you saw being taught, which I'll come clean on, was my wife's class. Um, mostly non-majors, gen ed classes. Um, students that get turned on to the major by taking those classes. And, and a lot of it comes down to the fact that some, some students will push back when they say, you mean I actually have to do something? I can't just sit here or decide if they even want to come to class. You're never going to reach those students for sure. But if the problems that are being put out during the classroom activity are problems that seem interesting and curious, can as much as possible be tied to um, real life relevancy or curiosity that the students might have. Um, and the idea that they're building relationships with their other peers, which may even be their study mates to succeed in the class, all becomes a way of kind of engaging them. And I think this has been key to why both she and I are university level teaching award winners, because the, the students say, I couldn't have cared less about this topic, but it was interesting. I came to understand things that I never thought I would care to know. And I built relationships with people and with the professor along the way. I mean, I can't tell you how many folks have approached me like three years down the road to write letters of recommendation for a job or for college because they realized that none of their other faculty members actually knew how they worked in the team or how they thought. 
because all they knew was I could look in the grade book and say, oh, student got a B plus. They were probably fairly good. I can write that in my letter of recommendation. But I built, I built a relationship with the students and that's helping support their psychological needs and, and move them on. So it's really about, you know, you're not gonna get through for every student. It comes back to this idea, it's all individual. But there are things where we can do that move more of the students there. Lots of formative assessment that is either not graded or extremely low stakes. So the students feel like they're getting coached and getting feedback on building their competency to those higher stakes exams. Highly appreciated. The student isn't necessarily confident initially that they know something, that they can try to answer some questions and get some feedback. And it's like, yes, I'm succeeding. And that makes them feel competent. Um. Gary, there was a question a sh short while ago, which we didn't get to then. I'd like to go back to that. Uh, John said, I agree that this is all about the question. This is back when you were talking about how important it is, the type of question. However, different students behave differently. The relationship between motivation and technique of active learning is more complicated than just linear. And sometimes I feel like it is a chicken and egg kind of relationship. Um, any any intense? I think um, one, one of the things I've often advocated with folks is uh, they're thinking about active learning and they're thinking about how they want it to be interactive. They want a lot of the uh, learning to be in, in pairs or small groups of some sort. Yes, that's highly advantageous. But we often, I think, underestimate or overestimate that how the learners know how to learn in a group. Um, and so having some activity time that's really based on having the learners think about how are we gonna learn together and spending some time on that upfront and building relationships with one another really becomes critical. Having the same teams is constant throughout the course. It's been repeatedly shown in the research to be critical. You do not have people in different groupings every time. You have to build that relationship with your learning team. Um, and, and a lot of times it's the relationship building and understanding, giving some students some hints on how to build their team learning, which they appreciate because that teamwork skill is a critical skill for careers and moving on. So I used to get students to, to, to uh, buy into this first day of class. We talk about what are the things that employers say they most want in a college graduate. And it turns out that working with others and being a leader are right at the top of the list. It's like, so do you think you should develop those skills in your classes? And how are you going to do that if we don't do it here? So that actually becomes one of the objectives for the class. And it's being tied into how you're doing work in class. So that's how I try to approach it. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from Heather. Uh, what activities do your longer workshops on this topic walk faculty through so that they can begin to develop strategies for use in their own course? and that we at UNC uh, Charlotte CTL might implement in the future with our own programming. We spend more time doing Q&A throughout. We uh, actually uh, have more interactivity of people sharing what they see in the videos and debating and discussing it. And then we set aside um, about a 20 minute work session there after the videos and discussion for people to just be able to sit back and with some prompts sit down and say, what do I do now at each level of ICAP? Or what could I be doing? Um, that doesn't necessarily take them very far in that amount of time, but it's giving an opportunity to think about, well, how do I transfer this in my own teaching while I'm here and I have this protected time? Because you're all gonna walk off and go to lunch and do other things and it may be difficult to come back to this again. We actually, as I mentioned, for the SDT part, uh, have the student, have the faculty get together in groups and they make their own list of the things that support or take away from the um, basic psychological needs. And then we gallery walk those. And a lot of people take photos of those and, and we give another 20 minute pause for folks to, to say, how can I, you know, what would be the implications for my teaching? How can I do that? So we try to get a little bit of transfer time into the workshop as well. Okay, thank you, Gary. We've got another question here. Um, can you comment on the impact of active learning on inclusive learning, given the parallel national conversation around equity? That's a great question. And, and if you're not aware, I can send some um, bibliography and some papers along 
Um, the, the argument has been made for almost a decade now based on research mostly on life science, education, that active learning is a matter of equity. That students that tend to be uh, underrepresented in the STEM fields tend to come with less preparation from college, uh, more likely first generation college learners. Uh, have much higher failure rates in uh, lecture-dominated STEM classes than um, in the active learning environment. Um, this has been repeated over and over again. And given the present climate, one of the papers that appeared, I think, in the science last summer actually put in the title that this is a matter of equity. Uh, because we tend, for instance, we in a, in a truly statistical way, if we talk about achievement gaps and performance of one group of learners versus another, we often talk about the achievement gaps between uh, those that come from higher socioeconomic status families and uh, had better resources in the schools that they had their college prep in and so forth versus others. But a lot of times the students that are down in this category as well also perform very poorly on uh, standardized exams and so forth. So we need to understand, uh, think about what that means. One of the key studies, which was actually done in Scott Freeman's lab, um, they actually tried to look at biology uh, achievement over a number of years, and they, they normalized for student preparation coming in. They found that the strongest correlation with 11,000 data points between learning outcome at the end of the course was with SAT score, SAT verbal score, and the GPA at the student hand when they walked in the door. So given that, let's push aside what students fall into different categories and let's see what their course performance is at the end. And it turned out in a lecture dominated class, the, the, the correlation holds up very, very strongly. In the Actus very well designed structured active learning class, it falls apart. The achievement gap closes considerably and it doesn't close by harming one group while raising the other. It floats all boats and it brings one up more disproportionately greatly. Some of this kind of work has actually been done in your state as well. And um, so I very much see it as a matter of equity and very few folks have tried to endeavor to explain why it is. I've made some suggestions in other talks. Um, there's, there's a parallel literature on sort of cognitive styles and approaches to learning that come from different um, environments of growing up. Uh, not to stereotype at all, but there's a greater tendency in working class families in rural environments, uh, among immigrant family environments, in African American um, families, to view the idea that we are interdependent, we depend on one another, we do things together, we count on each other, we learn together, we learn by doing things and watching each other, we learn from our aunts and our uncles and our parents and our family, extended family, siblings. There's a greater tendency for the more college educated, suburban, white, um, white collar uh, attitude to be interdependent, or be independent. We're on our own, we do things on our own, we don't depend on anybody else. So much of higher education is designed for that second group. And it deliberately puts that first group at risk. And there's been a tremendous amount of literature about that. I point particularly to Nicole Stevens at Northwestern University. And, it, and that research has essentially said with all this hype and conversation about providing greater access to college education is going to help um, remove our inequities. And these researchers say, no, college is increasing the inequity because it's entirely set up to favor one group of learners over the other and not to bring along the group that we're saying we really want to serve better. Okay, we'll get off of that so far. Okay, I think Julie has a question. Yes. Um, so early, uh, when you're kind of introducing on um, the idea of generative learning, um, it seemed that you were also making connections between teacher and student generative kind of learning, uh, not just student to student. 
our peer groups to peer groups. Um, I may have misunderstood that, but that's some of what I was gleaning and, and what you were saying at the introduction. So if that's the case, um, I guess I'm wondering how do you feel or see like enacting <laughs> the generative process yourself rather than just providing opportunities um, for students to engage in that. Um, and if that is a consideration for you, what's been your greatest challenge in that? Yeah, I think, first of all, I think maybe to clarify what I was trying to get across is, is generative learning is something that really happens in the mind of the learner. And it's really a matter of, I have come up with a scheme of organizing this information. I have reached a conclusion that was not what was in the lecture. It was not what was in the book. I may have co-generated that with somebody else. If it was co-generated with a, with a teacher, you want to make sure that it wasn't just the teacher putting it in the head of the student. Um, I think a lot of times in our, in our um, lower division courses, particularly in STEM, which I'm more familiar with, um, it can feel more like the faculty member isn't learning and they really know it and they're trying to provide the opportunities for the student to generate it rather than the authority telling it to them. So that they actually, so that the student is really generating it. I think a lot more often in humanities and social science instruction, we see where faculty make themselves vulnerable to learn from the experiences of the classes going. And therefore they're really actively voicing that that learning is taking place. In my own graduate course teaching, I'm very much that way. I try to bring up the idea that we're all learners here. <laughs> and I expect to know a lot more about the topic of this course when it's over uh, because of the opportunities you create for me to undertake generative learning activities, not just because of the ones that I undertake. Um, I think it's a little easier with a, with a more mature group of learners who are bringing a body of knowledge that is really ready to be, you know, cooked together in the stew. Nonetheless, you know, I, I'm always acknowledging, even with lower division undergraduate students when I used to teach those courses, uh, when it was that they were teaching me something, when they brought up an insight or an idea that I had never thought of and realized, okay, so let's explore that together. What, what more can we, what can we learn about that together? So acknowledging their autonomy uh, in bringing up an item for discussion um, acknowledging that even if they didn't have as deep a knowledge as I did, they were competent to reach that conclusion. And maybe with, we'll deconstruct it a little bit more, we'll find that it's partly true, but not quite. But we're going to talk through that together and learn about it. So participating in the process, I think, is still possible at all levels. Thank you, Gary. So we are at time. I have one more question I'm going to read and then this will be the last question for the session. And um, thank you everyone for coming out today. The last question is this work of motivating students and reaching all of them at just the right level is very challenging work. Do you have suggestions for how to get faculty collaborating on it and recognition for it at the institutional level? Yeah, I will say that I think one of the, the best ways of trying to help deal with the issue that your students are of all different levels of motivation and knowledge that they bring in, again, comes back to having the students work together in groups, particularly if those groups remain stable during your course and you purposely created them to be heterogeneous with regard to the, to the attributes of the learner, which included their preparation, they're gonna learn a whole heck of a lot from one another, more so than they will from you. Um, and so you can help, you know, it kind of falls into Vygotsky's old diet idea of the zone of proximal development. You, they will actually, you can help alleviate some of those issues there. So for faculty working together, some of what we've done with these principles and concepts uh, has been related to bringing together teams of faculty that um, teach the same uh, lower division courses, service level courses, gen ed courses. Um, and saying, you're going to need to do this work together and take advantage of each other's variability and teaching experience and competency and motivation and see what you can learn from one another. Um, most of our teaching observations that we encouraged when I was still doing faculty now on the main campus was saying, go and watch your, your colleague teach less to give feedback to them on their teaching than it is to learn about what they were doing 
and see what can I, how can I use that? And sit down with them afterwards and why did you do that? As well as share, do you know what the students really did when you did that? Because I can watch their overt behaviors and you couldn't. So, so they produced these very rich conversations between faculty that were built around observing what the students are doing, both as the teacher of the class and an observing teacher. And particularly when it was teams of faculty that taught the same course in different semesters or different times or rotated amongst them, that could include part-timers and adjuncts and even graduate students. The idea was we're learning from each other how to teach this content in more engaging ways. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Along the way. yeah, we we have a wonderful program at UNC Charlotte called Top Teachers Observing Peers, and it is exactly what that program does. So it's good to hear that we're on the right track. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for coming to us today from the University of New Mexico and for presenting. You're getting lots of accolades here in the chat that you can take a look at. Thank you. And my email I just stuck in chat too, if you didn't see it on earlier slides, I'd be happy to continue the conversations with any of you and hope to learn from you along the way. Thank you so much.